Hello, everybody. My name is Maciej Brodecki. Uh, I'm from Cygnus SA, uh, Polish deep tech company. Uh, and I uh, want to welcome you to the replay of the uh, webinar about confocal microscopy uh, as a part of the sixth edition of the Knowledge Has Layers event uh, brought to you uh, by Cygnus. Uh, today with me uh, are some extraordinary guests, uh, Karolina Sobeczek uh, from Cygnus, uh, Magdalena Kulczycka from uh, Central European Bioforum, and uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Geriant uh, Wilde from Andro Technology. Um, welcome you all. And uh, first, I would like to introduce everybody to the agenda of that webinar. Uh, we will start with the presentation uh, uh, from Carolina about Cygnus. Next, uh, we will uh give uh, um, a, um, a place uh, to geriant uh next we will hear a few words uh, uh, from magdalena and after all of that we will uh have an q and a section uh for all of your questions so please uh write them down in the q and a section uh while listening to the presentations uh so we can start, uh, Karina. the stage is yours. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, being here. Here you go. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Maciek, for the introduction. Uh, just uh, let me share my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So, as Magic said, I'm going to shortly introduce Cygnus. So, who are we? We are a group of people, actually, right now around 70 people engineers, scientists, designers who are interested in uh, new technologies. We are based in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, you can find us uh, in the campus of Warsaw University and in the prototyping terrace of Cambridge Innovation Center. We are present in social media, press, TV. We are a fast growing company. Last year, we were granted 48th place by Deloitte. Our production site. Uh, with um, different ma additive manufacturing um, instruments, equipment, as well as uh, R&D laboratories are placed uh, also in the university. Right now, we are running more than 20 million slots in fast track projects. The one worth mentioning is that we developed first in the world low temperature glass uh, 3D printer. Cygnus um, is divided by the three uh, different brands. Uh, Cygnus New Technologies, Biotechnologies and Nanotechnologies. Those are three different brands, but we closely work together on different projects. The new part focuses on industry. Uh, 3D printing, um, rapid prototyping. The other part uh, is regarding instruments, high vacuum. In the bio part, uh, we offer different uh, equipment instruments that can be used uh, while working with tissue models, spheroids, single cells, microparticles. We partner with Bico Company, Under Instruments, Floigent Nanolife, Tissues, and other uh, biotech companies, not just biotech, <laughs> new tech. Uh, we offer microscopes, live cell microscopes, and confocal microscopes, cameras, and modules for patterning, um, software solutions uh, for um, image analysis based on artificial intelligence, equipment for cell, single cell protocols, 
and fluid handling for bioprinting, microfluidics, um, cell culture, spheroids analysis, and uh, other uh, that are not presented here. But if you would like to see or test one of our instruments, uh, let me know. We can organize a presentation at your lab or, or at our facility and uh, show you how the, the equipment works. And actually, I would also like to invite you for uh, in two weeks, um, March 15th and in Warsaw and on Thursday, March 17th in Krakow, we will be hosting demo setups of, uh, about the confocal microscope that you will hear more about in a few minutes. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice webinar. Thank you, Karina. Uh, so, uh, just right now, I will give the opportunity for Jerian to show his part. Yeah, I, shall uh, I shall share my screen. Mm -hmm. This time, hopefully, it goes well. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, what I shall do is go into presenter mode. Okay. Can Sorry. you see my can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. I think I need to maybe hide this though, right? Stick that over there. Okay. So um welcome everybody. Thank you, Cygnus, for giving us the opportunity to present our brand new product to you. Um it won't be just a simple product presentation, there'll be some more learning in terms of the technology. Uh, for example, so uh, it's not just a it's not just a product presentation specifically. Um, so yeah, thank thank you, Matt Hitch and Carolina. So the title of this presentation today is Democratizing Confocal Microscopy, and it's our new benchtop microscope that actually helps to boost productivity uh, in your lab. I'm Geraint Wild, uh, as introduced. I'm the business and product manager for life science microscopy here at Andor. So Andor's been selling high-speed confocal microscopes for getting close to 20 years now, actually, in total, um, certainly 17 years. Um, so we have a lot of experience of people using our high-speed confocals in the laboratories. And what we noticed was that actually a lot of people use our um, quite sophisticated and relatively expensive, depending on, uh, on your needs, um, confocal um, systems um, in fairly routine ways. And so we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could actually turn our, uh, condense our confocal systems into something small and compact that could fit in a laboratory on a bench top and be part of a, of a workflow that didn't need any anything particularly special in terms of its needs, its environment. And we know that a lot of people uh, image, they use microscopy, a lot of you will be using microscopy. And if you're using relatively simple microscopy, then you'll be using fluorescence or, or bright field imaging. You may have, for example, sections that are quite thick that you often have to section, thin, so that when you put them on the microscope, you get the best detail that's possible. Um, and, and obviously, if you're having to section thick samples, simply to look at them under the microscope, uh, a section after section, and then rebuild them again to try and understand their you know, how, how, this, how your protein of interest or your structure looks in 3D, it's a painful process, it's, it's laborious, it takes time. Uh, and the reason why people use, oh, I've got a timing issue here, apparently. Um, the reason why people use, um, if you bear with me a second, I'm going to switch. There's obviously something here that's uh, got a timing issue on it. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Uh, uh, okay, I think I found the found the little tick box that was doing that. Sorry, my apologies. Um, so um, yes, so we thought the reason why people like a confocal microscope is it allows them 
to actually image six samples and then optically section them as opposed to having to section tissue uh, and prep it before you then put it on the microscope. And after all, most you know, life exists in 3D. So why image in 2D if you have technology that allows you to image in 3D? So any of you who have used a confocal microscope are probably familiar with uh, systems, confocal systems that look very much like something in these two images. So they're quite complex, they're quite large, they're relatively sophisticated because they are capable of doing very, very clever and complex experiments. But as I said, they're very big, complicated. They're normally um, in a, a dark room in a specialized facility. So they're sort of excessive for routine imaging, fluorescence imaging. They're relatively expensive, uh, both to purchase and to own. Um, but as I said, you know, sometimes your experiments need that level of, of technology and they have a large footprint. So we wanted to make confocal microscopy more accessible to, to more people. So this is the democratizing. So we wanted to make it affordable. We wanted it to have a small footprint. We wanted it to be high productivity. We wanted it be, to be super fast to learn. That's the other thing um, about uh, confocals. They are the, the ones that you saw quite sophisticated, so they take quite a time to learn to use. And we wanted it to have um, low running costs uh, as well, obviously. So now I'm going to uh, go into the more into more detail of what the BC43 is. It's not just a confocal because we realize that um, the other types of microscopy, so just simple fluorescence microscopy or even bright field microscopy, are, uh, are also methods that people want to use. So we have three imaging solutions in one. So transmitted light microscopy, we have available to you. We have wide field fluorescence microscopy. So that's what most of you will be familiar with already, I suspect, if you have a relatively simple microscope in your lab. And we have a confocal microscopy, obviously, which is the, the key feature of the BC43. So let's start with transmitted light microscopy, and I'll explain we have two modalities for that. So in bright field, so in bright field, this is when you just use a simple white light and you have a uniform column of illumination that shines onto your sample. Uh, and then the contrast in your sample, if it has some, is then captured by the objective and it reaches your camera and gives you an image. Uh, so this kind of bright field microscopy is fine for um, samples such as, sorry, I still have a timing issue apparently, um, are fine for samples such as that have natural contrast in them like plants or even small organisms like Daphnia, but they're less useful for transparent samples such as cultured cells, so monolayers of cells, of live cells, for example. So for, for, this sec for these transparent samples, we need something different. So we have a technique, uh, it's a unique technique uh, to us. So we have a patent pending on it called differential phase contrast, or we call it DPC for short. And in DPC, rather than it being a, a column of light shining uniformly down on the sample, we actually illuminate the sample at an angle. And this angle gives the effect, gives a sort of a dark, a light and shade effect, and, and therefore gives a sort of a 3D type looking uh, image from the from the sample. What's nice about it is um, that, uh, well, actually, what I would say is if any of you are familiar with DIC, so that's differential interference contrast, then DPC gives you a similar kind of um, illumination and a similar kind of look to your sample. But what's nice about DPC is that there's no need for specific specific objectives. So uh, another contrast technique that some of you may be familiar with is phase contrast. If you have phase contrast in the objective that you use, there's a little ring, a little dark ring inside that objective. And actually that cuts out, if you're doing fluorescence microscopy, that ring um, limits, it, it drops your the amount of light you can get through your objective by about 10%. So you lose some of the transmission, some of the, the light that comes into your into, through your objective, 
And when you're doing fluorescence imaging, typically you want as much light as you can. So it's good if you can to avoid objectives that have these phase contrast rings inside them. So DPC doesn't need a special objective. Uh, also, unlike DIC, differential interference contrast, which uses polarized light and therefore has very special optics, which, which add actually price to the instrument as well, um, we don't need polarization optics. Um, and the other uh, thing here is, is consequently then, is that we have, I still have a timing issue, uh, DPC delivers uh, high contrast and high resolution imaging, even in unstained samples. So I'm just going to, this is just a very quick example of um, DPC. So this, this is what DPC looks like. This is a sole fish. And then this is the uh, fluorescence image overlaid over it. So I'll just go back again. So as you can see, DPC gives you this uh, detail of the whole head of the sole fish here in quite specific detail. You can see the teeth. Uh, you can see uh, the fins here at the top and uh, its, its spine here. And then when you take an image of fluorescence, which is only going to label part of your sample, then the fluorescence image you can see then the, the fluorescent signal still in the context of the rest of your soulfish. So it gives you extra information, which is always helpful. And we can apply this to wide field or confocal imaging modalities. As I said, they're more challenging than something big like that soulfish are cultured cells. And here you're looking at cultured cells. This is in a multi-well plate, though we're imaging multiple wells. So you can see the images building over time. But you can see quite, see quite clearly that DPC allows the user to see the cells quite clearly. So I'll just play that again. So you can see cells that don't have any staining quite clearly, uh, as well as those that obviously are positive. They have, uh, in this case, red fluorescent protein uh, tagged to a protein of interest, and then they're watching it in their cell populations. So let's move on to uh, wide field fluorescence illumination. So this is one of this is the other modality, one of the three modalities that we have. So in wide field uh, fluorescence, we simply so now instead of the light coming from above the sample, what we do is um, fluorescence, as you hopefully most of you know, uh, the fluorescence signal, the light that illuminates the sample comes up through the objective and illuminates the sample, and then we capture an image from the sample, which is basically mirrored, uh, you, you focus on it, and then uh, what you see is basically determined by the focal depth of your objective. So wide field systems are extremely useful for thin samples, so monolayer cultures, for example, or sectioned samples. They're great for fast events. Because you're getting the maximum light possible uh, in the system, then you can have short exposures and, and image very fast. And also, uh, wide field fluorescence imaging is particularly useful for samples that are very sensitive to light. So you want to keep your illumination levels as low as possible so that they survive, so that the light doesn't perturb their physiology. Um, and then, um, oh, the other, alter the other one, of course, is as well, is that um, if you have a sample that's got very low uh, expression, so it might have very low gene expression or very low protein expression, then again, you want the maximum amount of light as possible from the optical system reaching your camera and giving you an image. One of the challenges with um, uh, as, as good as confocal is, and we can, and confocal can be, um, uh, is, is pretty sensitive, especially our systems uh, that we use, which I'll explain shortly. At the end of the day, the way confocal works is it's still limiting some light coming through the optical system. So wide field could still be uh, the imaging modality of choice, uh, depending on your experimental setup and your needs and how, how bright your signal is. So that's why we, we, we don't just, we don't have a system that is just confocal. We still give you the other imaging modalities should you need them. So here is a good example of, so a great litmus test, a great test for knowing if a, if a microscopy system is, is good for live cell imaging is actually looking at cells divide. Because cells, if they're unhappy, if they have too much light and phototoxicity, they won't 
they won't divide. They, they, they stop in cell division. And you can see these cells are very happily over a period of 24 hours dividing. We can image for much longer. We can image for days. Um, but, but, that, but that is basically showing uh, how, how um, gentle the illumination is and therefore safe for live cell imaging. So actually, this image here that I showed you is relatively low mag. Um, I think if I remember rightly, this is a uh, 40 mag uh, objective. But ultimately, uh, a lot of people want to actually look at internal cellular structures of a cell. So things like the cytoskeleton, actin, microtubules, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. And so as you go up in magnification, your focal depth of your objective gets thinner so when you actually so relative to the sample the sample is is actually quite thick but the but the cell that but the bit you're focusing on is is just a thin section within that and so in wide field what what, what can happen is is you capture an image uh, like this so what this image here has been captured from a single cell and we've basically captured a, a z series through it so the Z series is taking an image, starting at the top of the cell, moving the focus down just a little bit, taking another image, moving the focus down again and taking another image until we've gone through the whole of the cell. And then this is the final result. So you can see in, in this cell that uh, you can see that there's four different colors. You can see that there is some structure, for example, the cytoskeleton here, the mitochondria here, but the, it, it's still a little bit, um, not out of focus, but there's a haze. It's not very clear. It's hard to see the specific detail. So what many people do with wide field fluorescence microscopy is they actually use some image processing. And this image processing is commonly called either deconvolution or image registration, or some people now also start to call it digital clearing. In our software, our Fusion software, we have something called Clearview. It's deconvolution. And we can use this to actually take, improve the contrast of the image. And what, what, what deconvolution or image registration or digital clearing does is, is the outer focus light in the sample here. So what's, what's happened is the objective has captured what's in focus, but then it's also captured the outer focus information either side, which, is, which results in this, this haze. And what deconvolution does is it the, the algorithm knows the optical properties of the system and it knows where the outer focus light originated from. And the algorithms basically reassign the light to where it came from. And the result is that you end up with this much more, uh, uh, much higher contrast, more detailed, higher resolution image. So that's how you can use something like deconvolution with a wide field image to give you a great image. And, and this is just something that we can do on the BC43. We have this algorithm there for you to use. So even when, even when, even if you can't do confocal and you have wide field, you still have the ability to improve your, the resolution and the detail in your image. This is uh, the same sample, just a different cell. This cell is going uh, into cell through cell division. So this is an XY. This is just a single optical plane after deconvolution. This is just a single optical slice, and we're seeing it in X and Y. And then this is looking at it orthogonally. So this is the X. Uh, this is the YZ view. So this would be like looking at it side from the side, and this is the XZ. And then on the right here, you can see. Uh, before and after the clear view deconvolution. So you can see how much detail it's possible to see from these samples. And then this is just a, a view. So this is, a, this is showing you how we've basically, this image is made up of many um, images taken from different focal planes. And we just, as I said, we capture the whole volume of the cell. And then this ultimately then cultivate, cult culminates, I should say, in the ability to then take this sample and and um, move it into uh, in, through into some analysis software, so you've gone to the trouble of capturing this beautiful three D data set. Uh, in Fusion, we are really lucky to have the Amaris. So Amaris is the um, 
is the market leading 3D visualization and analysis software that, that is also part of our product portfolio. And the uh, so and, and within within Fusion we have the Amaris visualization engine. So it means that when you're capturing an image from the BC43, you are we immediately give you the 3D image actually developing in real time as the as the microscope catches the image. So immediately you'll be able to review your data. So you start so you start off basically with uh, an image that looks like sorry apologies. You start off with an image that looks like this in Fusion, and then you can take that data set, which is a 3D data set. You can then export that data set into Amaris if you wish. And then in Amaris, you can start to do things like surface rendering. And you can rotate and you can investigate the structures in a complete 3D environment. And then obviously, you can even go on to count count structures and features and you could compare for example uh, in cancer research uh, an ex a, a drug treated group of cells to a to an untreated group of cells and then look at the difference in in cell counts in feature counts between those different cell populations so why do you need a confocal if we're able to do wide field and deconvolve why do, why do you need a confocal so one of the reasons is that even even if you're running uh, thin have thin samples, you could avoid having to do the deconvolution at all and just work all of the time when it when it when it's suitable when your sample has enough uh, it has strong enough staining for example you could just use confocal the whole time because that will always give you the highest contrast and the sharpest images. But when you certainly want to think about moving to confocal is when your sample becomes thicker than sort of 30 to 50 microns. Anything over about 30 to 50 microns, particularly at high magnification, starts to become challenging for the algorithms, the, the deconvolution algorithms uh, in combination with the wide field fluorescence images. So as soon as you get to 30 to 50 microns or more, then you really do need to start considering confocal because the, the deconvolution algorithms uh, find it hard to work effectively uh, under, those, under those thicker conditions. So this is a good example. So this is a, the soulfish again. Uh, you saw a version of this before. And if I capture a wide field image of this thick sample, so this sample is 521 microns thick. If I capture this sample, uh, this thick sample here, this is what it looks like. But if I use confocal, so there's no deconvolution here, just confocal, then immediately I can see all of the detail in this thick sample. I can see this is these are nerve, these are uh, this is the nervous system here. Uh, I think this is tubulin, uh, tubulin. I think if, uh, if I remember rightly, uh, and uh, the yellow uh, here is muscle uh, muscle structure, so muscle fi muscle fibers, myosin. So you can see the difference between the wide field and then the clarity that you get in the confocal image. So this is why uh, confocal really starts to benefit your research and your work. And that's the two images side by side. So in order to help you understand the higher productivity, so I've mentioned the fact that BC43 is a high productivity uh, solution. I need to just explain a little bit about uh, confocal, and and this might be something that you, uh, you you're not familiar with already. So, so just a little bit of a principle of of how a confocal works. So we have the specimen here, or we'd have the specimen here. This is the objective, and then this is in the main optical path of the system, and then ultimately up here we have the detector. So in our case, it's a scientific camera. We're a camera company, and we use a scientific camera as the detector. Now, in, in a confocal, like normal fluorescence microscopy, you have a light source that needs to excite your sample at a short short wavelength. So, for example, 488 nanometers uh, for GFP. Um, and uh, in the case of a confocal, that light source is a laser. So the laser, uh, the excitation light will, come, will bounce off a dichroic through the objective to the sample. And then the light then from the sample comes back at a longer wavelength through this dichroic and then through to the other side of the optical system, uh, optical path. Now, 
anything that's out of focus so this 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 uh orange this red orange line uh here is considered out of focus information anything that's out of focus when it gets to the other side of the dichroic what we have in a confocal and critical to a confocal is a pinhole so this is the pinhole here and any out of focus light actually gets blocked by this solid mask either side of the pinhole and it's only in focus light so this is the green line here it's only in focus light that's able to pass through the pinhole to the detector in our case a camera so that's the working principle of a confocal the key bit here is that we have a pinhole that only lights only allows in focus light through to the detector there are different types of confocal probably the one that most of you uh, if you've used one are familiar with would be the point scanning confocal but there's also another increasingly popular uh, and very uh, long-standing technology called a multi-point confocal or spinning disc confocal and that's what we have in the bc43 but let's go back to the point scanner for a second so the way the point scanner works is the 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 illumination system is such that you illuminate the sample with a single point of light um, and obviously you detect that single point of light in the case of a multi-point uh, confocal or spinning disc confocal like in the bc43 we actually have multiple pinholes that are um, illuminated, illuminating the sample at any one time. And so this means we get more light uh, through to the system and hence it becomes more productive. The next slide will show you this in more detail. So I mentioned that we, we have multiple pinholes. So in a, in a spinning disk system, we have a disk that spins at high speed with thousands of pinholes in. And that's illuminating the whole of the sample in confocal illumination all at the same time. In the case of a point scanning confocal, as I said, it's one point of light that's hitting the sample. And then what happens is that point of light is scanned from left to right and then down through the sample over time. And the consequence is that unlike the spinning disk where you get an instant complete image in confocal, with a point scanner, you'll, the, the image develops a line at a time. The reason why we can capture an image, a whole image on, on the multi-point confocal in one go is that we have a detector, which is a camera. So we, we have a full uh, camera sensor. And so we can actually image the whole sample uh, along with the spinning disk at the same time. In the case of a point scanner, it has a photomultiplier tube. This is only able to capture light one pixel at a time which is fine because we're only illuminating the sample effectively one pixel at a time. But this is why this system is a slower uh, methodology for imaging your sample. The other thing to note here as well is that the detectors uh, in confocals, uh, like, the BC, like our BC43, they have a very high, what we call quantum efficiency. They have a very high sensitivity to light so it means that you can use short exposures or you're able to detect, to detect weak signals. In the case of a point scanner, their photomultiplier tubes uh, have a quantum efficiency of around about 45% or less. And so they're less sensitive. And so typically you need more light to illuminate a, a sample on a point scanning confocal. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have too much light on the sample, then this can give you challenges for um, things like phototoxicity and keeping your health, your cells healthy uh, if you're doing live cell imaging. Uh, but also it could lead to photo bleaching. So if you have a thick sample with a, with a point scanner, sometimes you can find that the deeper you go, you start to bleach uh, your sample. And so that can be a challenge as well. So those are the key differences. So, but what's I say the key the key point here is that when you have a spinning disk system like the BC forty three, it's fast and you are high, you end up with a highly productive imaging workflow, and that can be at least eight times faster or more. And I'll show you some examples of that. So, uh, let's start with this example here. So this example is a ninety three micron thick Drosophila egg chamber. And we've captured, basically, we've captured two colors in this. So we've looked, we're looking at two, uh, there's one is DAPI and the other one is uh, a, a cytoskeletal label. So we're, we're capturing two colors and 
we've captured this at, at Nyquist. Uh, so we've captured the whole volume here with very small Z steps to get the maximum detail in Z as well as in X and Y. So that means we've captured 309 Z planes. So individual Z, Z, uh, Im, Im, individual optical Z images. We've captured 309 of those, two colors. And the, the, the image size, the camera size is 2048 by 2000 pixels. We've captured that whole sample in around two minutes, which is really, really fast. If you were to do that same experiment on a point scanner, you would be looking at something closer to 20 minutes. So this, in this instance, is around about 10 times faster. So that's the productivity. Now, obviously, the other part of the productivity is being able to bring the BC43 into your lab rather than it being in a specialized room that you have to that you have to travel and take your samples to. So the key features uh, of the so what I'm going to do now is explain to you a little bit more about what what features the BC43 has um, that, that that can help you in your research. So I've already mentioned that it has real-time 3D visualization. So we have the Amaris engine, as I mentioned. So as you capture a Z series, a Z stack of a, of a, of a sample, the Fusion software literally starts to build that immediately whilst you're capturing. The advantage for that is if, you have, if you've set a Z stack and you've, you've, you've done a range from starting at the top of your sample to the bottom of your sample, if for some reason your sample moves or maybe you've got those settings a little bit wrong, you'll very quickly start to see that you set your experimental setup incorrectly and then you can then start again. Uh, in a lot of systems, you would, it, you, you would maybe not realize that until the end of the experiment. It has, uh, sorry, it has four laser lines. So these are the excitation lines. So 405, for example, for DAPI, 488, which would be GFP, um, Alexa 488, 561. So that would be things like DS Red, um, Alexa 560, um, and then 637 nanometers. So for Sci-5 and Alexa 640, for example. So this will cover all of the main, all of the, the key dyes that a lot of people use routinely. We have a, a patented form of illumination in the BC43 called Borealis. So Borealis means that we, we are able to put the best uniformity of illumination uh, on the sample. Uh, which is useful because if you don't have what good uniformity, if, for example, you're uh, wanting to uh, analyze intensity of, th of the signal of your fluorescence probe as a means of measuring um, the presence of a protein or something like that, if, if you're not uniform across the full field of illumination, it makes actually analysis and then interpreting that data challenging. Borealis uniformity is also very important for when you're wanting to do image large samples. So often you'll have samples larger than just the single field of view that you're looking at. So what you want to do is you want to take tiled images and then stitch them together into a bigger image. And if you have poor uniformity, you will see all of the little edges of each individual tile, whereas really you just want to have a nice, beautiful, single large image. So that's where Borealis is helpful. And I'll show you examples of that shortly. We wanted to make, uh, obviously this is a bent, this is a microscope in a box, so there's no eyepieces. So we need to help you to find your sample. So we do have a, obviously a, a, a joystick so that can control navigation, so X, Y, and, uh, and Z. Um, but uh, that's just, that's not enough in its own right. So what we need to do is we, we have, we, what we've employed in the system is we have a system of finding your sample to start with. So you put your sample on, you click a button, and the system will automatically look for your sample and find it. And then the same mechanism then can be used to lock the focus. So if you're doing live cell imaging over a long period of time, you want to be sure that the, your sample stays in focus the whole of that experiment. If you if the room in if the temperature in your laboratory, for example, changes, then the focus could change. So this focus lock mechanism uh, ensures that your sample always stays in focus. And then we have a nice uh, a tool for sample overview. So when you first put your sample on, again, because you have no eyepieces, we start you at a low mag objective, two at two times uh, uh, magnification. And then you're able to do a large sort of sample overview 
specify where you want to image and then when you go to the higher mags uh, you could you, you'll be in the in the spots in the area that you want to image and then not uh, last but not least obviously this is going to go into a lab here for example in this lab you've got a little um, bench top centrifuge but this could be like one of those vortex mixers for example they cause vibration so what we have built into the BC43 right in the base here are some anti-vibration feet so that whilst you're imaging any vibration from instruments like this little centrifuge doesn't cause problems uh, for your imaging systems so that you, you maintain image stability and good quality images. So this is an example of the Borealis illumination. So this is a, um, this is actually a relatively thin sample. So this is 77 Z planes, four colors, but this whole image is comprised of 28 individual images. So if I pause that there for a moment, this image is made up of 28 individual images, but you wouldn't know looking at this movie that that's the case because Borealis is, is giving you this fantastic uniformity. Actually, I don't have an example, I realize now, of what, what it would look like without Borealis, but the result would be that, uh, if I pause the image again, that you would actually see the edges of each individual image uh, in the final one, and so it wouldn't look as good. So another example of the productivity here. So this in total, this whole uh, four colors, 77 planes, 28 tiles, that's 15,092 images. And we captured that all in just 30 minutes. Um, the equivalent on a point scanner, again, would take around about six hours. So you can see again, this high productivity. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, don't forget as well that this resolution, this this time it's taken has been at 20, 2048 uh, by 2000 pixels. So it's high resolution images that you're capturing as well. So I said that we need to help you find your sample. So when you first put your sample on, you can have, uh, I said, this low mag um, image. And then with the software, you can very easily define the, the area that you want to image just by clicking on the image and then when you go to a higher magnification you'll already be where you want to start imaging um, so you can literally put a sample on use the fine focus identify where you want to image move a magnification you can do all of that in in just a couple of minutes it's really really fast so what have we what other features have we have we um, put into the bc43 that to help you to make this a you know a high productivity solution. So what's important is I mentioned to you earlier that a lot of confocals do quite sophisticated experiments, and one of the key things we wanted to do here because BC43 is well, whilst it is actually very sophisticated in in the in the quality of the images that it gives you, it is a, a you know it's for it is designed for routine imaging. So we, we wanted it to have a super fast learning curve. We didn't want it, it, we didn't want the BC43 to require an expert to teach you to use it. So uh, it was important to us that you could start imaging quickly, that you can find you can find and maintain your sample focus uh, using the focus seeker lock that I've mentioned. It's very important that it can do multi-dimensional acquisition. So that's X, X, Y, X, Y, Z, multiple fields, multi-well, uh, time series, and all of the different combination of those that you might wish to do because biology you know, people have you know when you're doing research and biological research you have many questions that require many many different types of microscopy protocols um sorry i've got a mouse issue there um and uh, also what we want to do is is there is the deconvolution which is a form of image processing and also actually the the, the I showed you that large image made up of individual tiles. Ultimately, they need to be stitched together. So we have a Maris stitcher also inside Fusion. So once you've captured those individual tiles, the image needs to be stitched. So that's also in an image processing uh, algorithm. So what we have is that when, when if you set up an experiment like montage, so tiled and stitched imaging, at the end of that experiment, you can automatically start the stitching process. So you might, for example, end the day set it, setting up the your, your BC43, 
setting up an experiment to do a large sample. That large sample could take an hour, two hours, maybe to, to actually capture the images. You can go, you can, you can leave the lab, you can leave it running. And then at the end of those two hours, the software will automatically start to deconvolve or stitch so that when you come in in the morning, the experiment is finished and your final result is there for you to, to, to start investigating. So looking at the super fast, looking at the learning curve. So we actually did, when we were testing the BC43, we obviously tested it with real users. And we looked at people who were uh, unfamiliar with either a point scanner or the BC43. And it was clear that people using a point scanner, it was quite a long learning curve for them. Um, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily a, a, an issue with with the point scanners um, themselves, but as I said, they you know they are instruments that are that are designed for quite complex experiments, uh, and so consequently the software can be quite sophisticated as well, and and can take some time to learn. Uh, but in the case of the BC forty three, we've tried to make the software interface so, so really simplified and condensed and, and and into a nice workflow, and so people were able to with just a few. Uh, tutorial videos just to get them going because we tried to not get involved in teaching them. There were just some tutorial videos. We found that even within an hour, they were able to do most of the image, most of those key, uh, so use most of those key imaging protocols. So like um, the time series and the Z stack and the multi field, for example. So it does have a super fast learning curve. Uh, and it doesn't require an expert to teach you how to use it. So I'll just give you a very simple, uh, give you a sense of the Fusion interface and the workflows that we have. So this is just setting up a Z-Stack. So you put your sample onto the BC43, it finds the focus, and you, you can take a single snap. Or you can take something like a three by three quick montage if you wanted to image a bigger area. Then you literally click on the bit of the sample that uh, you are interested in imaging at a higher mag. You move to a higher mag, so we start on the 2x, we move to the uh, 40x to this instance, and now we're able to see the Drosophila embryo uh, at a higher magnification. You set your Z series here, just the top and the bottom, or a middle and a, and a range, and you hit acquire. And then the result is within a few minutes, depending on uh, how many uh, Z sections you've taken, etc. Uh, you have your final image. In this, in this case, this image is just a 2D image because we've used a maximum intensity projection. But we have all the different views, 3D view, sync 2D view, different color channels. So it's a very simple workflow, very easy interface. This middle panel here is all about navigating your sample. And then this panel here, which can expand and collapse, uh, is where you set up your experimental protocols. Just to give you an example here, this is a focus, seek, and lock. So this experiment has been captured over actually just a few hours in this case. But what you'll see is that all four, this, this is an experiment where we had four uh, individual different fields in the, same, in the same experiment. So in this sense, we were able to capture four times as much data by using the multi-field experiment uh, protocol. And then if, you see, if I play it, you can see that these all stay perfectly in focus during the experiment. They don't drift out of focus. And the cells again are dividing very hap very happily. This was done in a in confocal, actually not wide field. This was a confocal experiment. So the focus the focus lock works well. Now everything I've shown you so far has either been fixed samples or cell division is still a relatively slow phenomenon. But it is possible to image fast events on the BC forty three. You can image either in confocal or wide field mode mode. Um, the speed that you can run obviously depends on how, well, depends on many things. It depends on how much light you can get to your sample, and therefore that determines uh, the exposure time. And the exposure time then obviously determines how fast you can image. So that's pred it's predominantly about how bright your sample is. Um, but also, you can run a little bit, you can run faster in wide field mode because there's more light coming through. Uh, there's no pinhole to obscure some of the light. So the wide field will run at faster frame rates. So it is possible uh, to go up to 44 frames per second on the BC43. And this example here is um, there, um, it's EB1 staining. So this stains the tips of microtubules as they're forming. 
and this is a cell going into division. So you can see here the the um, the uh, microtubules that form the structure that the that the chromosomes then align up against, uh, forming in that in that cell. So that particular experiment there was actually it was it was just two frames per second in this instance it, because this the the signal in that sample was actually quite low. So this was that was two frames per second uh, for that particular experiment in confocal. So I've nearly close to the end now. Um, so I've shown you that, uh, well, I've shown you a whole range of samples. So BC43 is really versatile. You can do image anything from cell lines to stem cells, cell tissues, organoids, drosophila, zebrafish, fatfish, mice cell, mouse cells. And even we've even actually imaged, imaged um, chicken, uh, some chicken, um, uh, structures structures in in developing chicken chicken so uh, and this is this is just some that there's there'll be plenty more that we've yet to, to try so it really is a very versatile instrument uh, and as, as a lot of research projects these days do cover anything from single cell right through to um, you know organs and even model organisms then uh, you, you've got a, a good a good versatile instrument here that you can add to your lab and it's just multi-scale imaging. So from single cell, high mag, through to uh, organs, uh, also model organisms or parts of model organisms here, like the Drosophila egg chamber, right through to whole sections of uh, tissue like the, um, sorry, like the uh, intestine. This is a ring of intestine here. So once you have these great images, obviously it'd be nice to analyze them in some way. So I've mentioned the fact that Fusion uh, has the Amaris visualization in it. Amaris is, uh, is an analysis, 3D visualization and analysis package. And so we save in the, in the Amaris file format. So it does mean then that you can export very easily the files from Fusion into Amaris if you, if you use or have Amaris as analysis software, and then you can do some analysis. So I'm gonna show you just one example here. So this is analysis using AI. Um, so, uh, so AI obviously is now increasingly becoming used in in um, uh, an analyzing microscopy, or, well, in, in life generally, but analyzing microscopy images. And AI is actually helpful because uh, in this instance we have. I'll give you an example. So this is zebra, zebrafish fin, and this is a group that's interested in bone regeneration. So what they do is they they've damaged the bone in the in the fin of the zebrafish just here, and what they want to do is they're interested in the bone regeneration, which is the pink area, uh, and also the cells. So these are osteoclasts that are uh, involved in bone resorption, and these osteoclasts are, are, are crucial to how bone can repair and then uh, re regenerate. So the first thing the researcher here is interested in is being able to identify and uh, the the um, the regenerating area. So this is used. This is actually highlighted by a stain, the magenta stain that they've used here. And then what we can do is we can use AI. So in Amaris, we can basically teach Amaris um, the the characteristics of the structure in pink. So we just give it some examples of, uh, and, and it basically takes the pixel information of that. And then it, then it can basically, from learning that, it can apply it across all of the rest of the sample. So it's, say, it's easier than somebody drawing a region and playing with intensity levels. It's just a much faster way to do this and also more robust. So the result is that having done that, if we look to the right-hand image, you can see how the, so this outline here is how Amaris has taken that information that it's been taught and it's automatically identified all of these bone regenerative areas in the sample. So in this slide, if you look at these two images on the right, just I've taken away the raw image so that you can see quite clearly what it is that Amaris has, has picked out and characterized using the machine learning, the AI. Also, what we've done here is the researcher is interested in these osteoclast cells. And of course, what they are, they're interested in, in the behavior of these osteoclast cells. So 
I guess the prediction, well, the prediction would be that where the bone is, is being regenerated, you would anticipate there to be more osteoclasts and a higher density of osteoclasts. And that, and that in this, at it, that, and that in some way, this would reflect the regenerative uh, activity in this experimental model. So what we've done here is Amaris is able to do spot detection. So we can, we can uh, get Amaris to, uh, auto, Amaris to automatically identify every individual osteoclast. And then what we've done is we've color coded them based on either distance from this, uh, from, from, a, from a, a magenta stained area or uh, the density, how, how close they are to one another. So one is distance away from an area. And then the color coding here is based on the density of them. And it can be whatever measurement is relevant to your experiment. And then uh, moving on just to make it a little bit. Uh, so, so another step here then is that, again, going back to the segmentation uh, and machine learning, we've not only identified in the first step the magenta stained area, but what we've also done now is we've also uh, sport Imaris to set, a, let's say, an outer boundary related to each of these positively uh, stained bone regenerative uh, regions of the sample. And by doing so, we can actually more meaningfully then uh, only include osteoclasts that are within the boundaries relative to each of these individual recovering or regenerating bones. So if we move to the right, what you can see is that remember that, that the, the damage, uh, the original damage to the fin is in this area here. And so what we can see is that this area on the left hand side is, has um, started regeneration, let's say, a longer time ago. And as you move to the right, this is damage that is, let's say, more recent. And so as you can see, the more recent the damage is, the more active the regeneration is. And the more active the regeneration is, the higher the number of osteoclasts re re relative to that region. Uh, over here, I should say, the, the only reason why these numbers are low over here is because actually there was, there was no damage uh, to this area. The fin naturally is quite short, so these bones are automatically short. So there's only a little bit, there's only a, a small amount of damage here from the original damage, but there is no there is no physical bone in the fin here. So that's why these numbers are low. So the key the key information that, that the research is interested in is predominantly in in these areas here. So and they can quite clearly see that when when the bone is uh, generating is, is it in its highest or let's say the peak of regeneration they have these uh, higher density and higher number of osteoclasts so this meant that analyzing counting and analyzing this would be really tedious obviously to do manually but by by bringing ai and spot classification uh, spot detection together uh, they can make analysis much easier and again improves your workflow so to summarize, BC43 is a benchtop confocal. It has three imaging modalities, the confocal, of course, but we also give you a wide field fluorescence and transmitted light microscopy because that's what some people still also need to image. It has a small footprint, no need for a dark room, a super fast learning curve. It's more affordable as a confocal imaging system than what most people are normally used to. It's capable of multi-dimensional microscopy. So time series, Z, multi-field, et cetera, creates stunning 3D images in an instant. And you can have it in the corner of a lab uh, or your facility such as this. And as a consequence, by putting it into a lab on the, on the workbench, then it means you can be prepping samples whilst you're also imaging samples. If you think of somebody, if you're a Drosophila imager, for example, you might be prepping lots of Drosophila on slides and so to have the microscope right next to you rather than having to walk across to a facility uh, definitely improves your workflow. So I would like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank again Cygnus for uh, hosting this and um, I'll hand back to, to the team at Cygnus now.
Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, now we have time for Magdalena uh, to talk a few words about the uh, European Central uh, Geoforum. I will give you Magdalena presenter mode. The stage is yours. Right, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Geraint, for your presentation. It's uh, really nice to pick on some science again, as uh, I used to be a scientist oh. once upon a time. <laughs> so it is really, really nice to hear about this. And uh, yeah, it's uh, really amazing that actually it's uh, your equipment is the size of, is the size of a centrifuge. Uh, yeah, ba yeah, basically, yeah. It's 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 yeah. We we didn't think we we weren't sure we could do it, but we but we did. <laughs> yes, it, it's yeah. It, it's, it's it's like a bench top. Yeah, about the size of a bench top printer or a, or yeah. a centrifuge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. For the fifty yeah. mil Falcons, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, yeah. I was a researcher. I was my. I was a neuroscience neuroscientist once as well. So, uh, so yeah, I love this stuff. Uh, so yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, thank you once again uh, nice for one. touching on, <laughs> filling the glimpse. Yeah. Um. Yeah. As I mentioned, I was a scientist once upon a time, uh, but then I turned into. Uh, into the business world more uh, and in the meantime uh, then i turned into the uh, tech transfer office at the Gelonian university so i know like you know both sides yeah what languages they use and uh, what are the obstacles and uh, sometimes in cooperation or what are the bottlenecks right yeah. so yes um, that's why i'm more than happy here to uh, to give a presentation about this uh, platform that we are using that because i strongly believe that networking is actually the key for the success it's like no man is an island you have we have to cooperate right yeah so um yes so thank you and and let me switch to to my presentation then okay i hope everything will work Technology, please cooperate. <laughs> so this is, um, I'm uh, director of this uh, networking platform, uh, Central European Bioforum. And our um, key activity is the event that we are holding on May 25th, 26th in Warsaw. And this is actually where, uh, where I'm really looking forward everyone to show up in order to uh, celebrate with us the 20th edition of the event. Uh, and also in order to, uh, as I mentioned before, to, you know, to gather all the stakeholders uh, in one spot in order to share the ideas and experience and uh, so as i mentioned this is a 20th jubilee edition and here are some highlights of the previous edition uh the last one was in 2019 obviously and we had a two years break now we are coming to you back with a um, fair uh, space where there will be a lot of companies showing their uh, expertise uh, there will be panel sessions covering various topics. Uh, there will be R&D projects from universities. Uh, and, uh, but we are not closing to only our uh, environment, Polish environment. We, we, are, we know that we need to cooperate globally. Therefore, we are inviting also international partners. Um, and so, this is actually how it looked uh, all through uh, the last 20 years uh, when the biotechnology uh, enterprises were uh, only showing up in Poland. And this is where Bioforum started uh, in order to, to gather all the key players uh, and in order to cooperate. So I'm more than happy uh, to to show you and invite you 
to this event where we will cover various topics uh, because as you know uh, probably as a scientist but biotechnology is a very very broad topic so we are uh, sh we would like to show how what kind of ap application has biotechnology and what kind of for example ai or digital solutions can facilitate the uh, the work or in biotechnology sector just as you mentioned before uh, in your presentation so we will uh, cover such topics as uh, pharmaceutical biotech development uh, uh, funding of biotech uh, projects uh, and also we will cover uh, the this will be also a very important topic the uh, human resources and biotechnology sector uh, i will relate this uh, to this uh, at the end of my presentation further on um so here um those topics that i mentioned before are uh, gathered uh, in our preliminary agenda where you can see that uh, what kind what kind of discussions will be uh, gathered during our event it's a two day event so here's the agenda for the day one and for the day two and day two will be culminated with the uh, c bioform awards and at the closing ceremony and uh, this is a uh, an, uh, ceremony where we want to highlight the outstanding entities even in various categories uh, so here are those cate categories seven of them uh, which i believe that are really interesting and uh, that uh, are um in that are uh, in order to show the interesting entities in the most important areas that are ongoing uh, in the biotechnology sector so we would like to highlight the companies that drive their r d up to the polish clinical trial or we want to highlight the uh, successful r d collaborations uh, as i mentioned uh, because i know how how difficult it is to create this kind of you know joint venture projects so this is uh, please feel free to join uh, visit our website and then you can fill in uh, and apply for the award by yourself and uh, so who will be who who are we addressing this event to uh, we would like to gather all the stakeholders that are creating the biotechnology innovation pipeline so starting from academia uh, supported with state institutions uh we want to gather as well uh companies either small or bigger ones uh startups obviously the, the you know the very brave people uh, who want to take the challenge uh and of course we uh we need uh, some 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 financial support for those startups or any initiatives so we want to, uh, we are inviting as well, investors uh, that facilitate those processes. You can join us then as a, you can show what you're doing either as an exhibitor or as a pitcher. Uh, we are, you can join us uh, on the scene. Uh, you can join us as a strategic or knowledge partner and uh, or just as an attendee in order to see how this biotechnology scene looks like and what are the stakeholders during our uh, on in our region or uh, in broader sense so if you would have any kind of questions just uh, feel free to call me or email me and uh, and please visit our website so there you see there you will have many more details uh that i 
obviously cannot cover here uh, during this short presentation. And here on the website, you'll find ev all the details uh, and uh, current information on our LinkedIn uh, and uh, Twitter uh, profile. So this is uh, the C Bioforum. And during this event, as I mentioned before, uh, we also want to put an effort on the very important aspect, uh, which is the uh, biotalent acquisition during, uh, by the companies. Therefore, we launched the uh, portal, the website, biotalents.com, uh, biotech talents, sorry, biotechtalents.com, where you can uh, sign, look for the Mm, uh, for job opportunities uh, or give an uh, announcement that you're looking for a specialist uh, in the field because we believe that we that the matchmaking is a crucial thing so this is what this is our aim and uh, we hope that this uh, website will facilitate this uh, talent acquisition process because we know that even the best project is not going to work if you don't have the right people to conduct it so if you would like to register or have any questions feel free to contact Agnieszka Tura uh, she's a responsible person uh, for biotech talents you can find it here's her email or you can visit uh, our uh, website or profile and she will be happy to, to contact you. So, and reply to any kind of uh, questions because I believe that um, there are a lot of very, very talented people who doesn't really want to leave Poland. I, I would say rather uh, that they want to stay in Poland and uh, contribute to the development because I know by, by experience that there are huge possibilities here in Poland. There are a lot of very interesting projects. It's just a matter of finding the uh, connection and to be, find the right spot to fit in. So um, this is what I would like to show you. Um, this um and it, so if you would have any questions or inquiries uh feel free to reach out to me or agnieszka and yes i we strongly believe that uh, this networking uh makes sense really so thank you very much thank you Magdalena. Uh for uh, introducing the, the forum uh, and also the platform uh, and where to find an interesting project in biotechnology in Poland to stay here to uh, contribute to in development of uh, new technologies. Uh, so um, right now uh, I want to ask our attendees uh, for any questions in the Q&A section, you can write them uh right there uh, on the left side uh, we will uh, uh be happy to answer them um maybe we will give you a, a few minutes to um, to get back in the memory uh and and write the questions uh in the q and a section uh if not i am uh, strongly uh, inviting you to write to us uh uh, to Cygnus, to uh, also to Ander, uh, with any questions about uh, confocal microscopy, any questions about uh, your forum, and questions about Cygnus, of course. Um, so I will give uh, like uh, three minutes for any questions to occur. Uh, thank you again to uh, all of three participants uh, uh, in this webinar. Uh, that was uh, very exciting presentation. Uh, we learned a lot today. Mm, uh, and I hope uh, that we will meet also uh, on other occasions to show another technologies uh, and other achievements also. Happy to come back. Oh, question. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, Carolina, you mentioned about the presentations of the of the equipment that are going yeah. to take place in March. Yeah, I did mention that. Uh, we will be sending uh, emails with the invitations, so don't worry, everything will be written and uh, to not forget about it. Uh, the, there are two meetings. One is in Warsaw on uh, March 15th on Tuesday and the other one is in Krakow on uh, Thursday, uh, it's 17 March. Uh, and yeah, feel free to bring your samples and uh, see what BC43 can do. My question would be where? Uh, the Where first we should one, bring the samples? <laughs> um, the first uh, meeting uh, is in Nensky Institute in Warsaw, and the second one is JCI in Krakow. All right. The Center, yeah. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Sadly, I won't be. I, I, as I was saying to Carolina earlier, sadly I won't be there because uh, I don't. I don't know. Well, we have so many demos going on, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck. Well, I'm stuck in here in my home office actually most of the most of the time at the moment. Uh, but but, uh, they, yeah. but they let you out from time. They to let time. me out every now and again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah That's yeah. great. No, I do actually. Now it is good. Actually, we're starting to able to to travel and and. Uh, no, lab, lab, labs are a bit too easier to no well it's been it is true it's been a bit like that <laughs> so so uh but now it is easier so i have started to do some travel recently which is, which is nice <laughs> yeah yeah on the road again huh oh well, yeah kind of yeah i mean i love my family but it's good it's good to get it's good to get away <laughs> stop, stop recording <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, okay, I, I didn't see any questions uh, in the Q&A section, uh, maybe just because the presentation was so full of information or okay. so completed. Uh, so uh, again, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Uh, if someone uh, will have any questions uh, after the, the webinar, please contact us. We will pass them to the uh for elegance of this webinar thank you very much and uh, i hope you have a great time today thank you you, thank too. you very much you. cheers you. Bye. Nice meet you all. bye, bye.